We have two passages of scriptures we'd like for you to look at this morning. One of them is Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 and then Colossians chapter 1. There are several verses we're going to look at in Colossians chapter 1. I'll give you a moment to find that. I always encourage you to bring a Bible. Open it up and read it. If you don't own a Bible, let us know. We'll give you one free of charge. We want you to have a copy of God's Word. And we always encourage you to read your own while you're here. Get more accustomed with your copy of God's Word. Uh, some of the scriptures will be on the screen. Some of them may be partially up there. And Anyhow, you need your Bible in front of you. It just will be a blessing to you. We want to talk about God's grace this morning and knowing God's grace. Uh, knowing what it is is one thing, but experiencing it is something else. And I want to tell you, some of you are in the process and have experienced God's grace. You're still in the process of experiencing God's grace. And if that's the case, I hope that during the course of this message, you just have to stop and take a minute and say, thank you, Lord. <laughs> you just praise God for His wonderful grace and His mercy that He's given to you. But maybe you haven't received God's grace. Well, our prayer is that you will today. You see, when God blesses us with any kind of blessings that we don't deserve, that's God's grace. Doesn't matter what it is. That's God's grace. And when you stop and think about it, when you understand what God's grace includes, we add that amazing word in there, that one that we find in the song that we sing, amazing grace. That's how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Well, I'm not going to sing it to you. You're blessed. But we'll be at least thinking about it and talking about God's grace and how, uh, how amazing it can be. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that's not of yourself, it's a gift of God. By God's grace you are saved. You know what that means? You don't deserve it, but God's willing to do it anyway. Understand that God's grace is an offer of a free gift that we don't deserve. And it's true in every area we're going to look at this morning. We don't deserve any of the blessings that God is offering to us. But again, you can either receive it or reject it. It's entirely up to you. Wisdom says you receive God's grace because anything that God offers you is going to be good. Not bad, not so-so, but really good. If God is offering it to you, it's because He loves you and He wants to bless you. And so that's His grace. When God reveals the truth of the gospel to somebody... And the fact that we are sinners, we've broken His commandments, and we're bound for hell and can do nothing about it on our own to change that. When that truth is revealed to an individual, that is an act of God's grace. Just the revealing of the truth. Wait a minute, I'm, I'm a sinner. I've broken God's commandments. I, I don't deserve to be in heaven with Him. I deserve hell. I think I'll fix it on my own. And then you say, no, I can't fix it on my own. I can't undo what I've already done. I can't save myself. When that realization comes to you, I'm going to tell you something. God gave it to you. That was an act of His grace. Did you deserve that bit of wisdom? No, you didn't. Because you're rebellious sinners. I am too. But God says, I love you. And so I want to let you know the truth. Not only have you broken my commandments, not only are you bound for hell, and not only can you do nothing about it, I want to tell you the truth, that that's not the end of my grace. Then he tells us about Jesus. He tells us about his wonderful son that he sacrificed on Calvary's cross, died the most horrible death imaginable to pay the price for our sins so that God can look at Jesus and look at what he did to pay for our sins so God can forgive us. And when that knowledge comes to us, that's an act of God's grace. When somebody comes and tells you that good news, the gospel, Jesus died for you. You don't have to go to hell. You can trust Him as your Savior. When somebody gives you that information, the fact that they gave it to you, that's God's grace. He prompted somebody to tell you that. He led you somewhere, somehow into the scriptures or a gospel track or saw it on TV or something. Somehow that truth came to you and when you did, you didn't deserve that, did we? We don't deserve the good news, but God gives it to us anyway. That's an act of His wonderful, wonderful grace. And then He takes us to a tomb that's empty. <laughs> 
And we realize that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and He is alive right now. And because He's alive right now in heaven, He can save anybody who will call on Him to save them. Knowing that is an act of God's grace. Otherwise, we wouldn't know it. Just to know it, it's wonderful. It's good news. That's God's grace. And when God reveals the fact that we can be completely forgiven and be fit for heaven... If we'll simply repent of our sins and trust Jesus as our Savior and Lord and ask Him to come into our hearts and save us, when that bit of information comes to us and we say, that's true, I accept that as truth, that is an act of God's grace too. Just mentally accepting it as you hear it, that's an act of God's grace. And then He gives us the faith to act upon the information that He's given us. Did you notice in that verse of Scripture it says, For by grace are you saved through faith. You see, we have to respond to God's grace or it's no good at all. Somebody offers you the key to a brand new automobile and said, here, would you like to have it? It'll be yours. We'll give you the pink slip. We'll fill it out. We'll make it yours. And you say, thank you. And you turn and walk away. You don't get the car. You have to receive it. So it is with God's grace. So it is with His mercy. So it is with His forgiveness. And so it is with every good thing that God offers us. We either receive it or say, no, thank you, and I walk away. You can do that. It's not wise, but we can. So many people do. But He gives us the faith that it takes to receive what He is offering. He offered His Son. It takes faith to receive His Son as our Savior and Lord. Did you notice we're saved by grace through faith? And that's not of yourself. It's a gift of God too. The faith that we have to trust Jesus and be saved, that's God's gift to us. What kind of gift is it? A gift of grace. Do we deserve the faith? No, we don't. But He loves us enough. He gives it to us anyway. God's grace. I want you to think about this for a moment. In heaven, there's no telling how many millions and millions of people there are. They're there because of God's grace. Go into heaven a thousand years from now and see the people that are in heaven. They'll be there because of God's grace. No other reason. None of them can say, I did this on my own. (laughs) God, God didn't give it to me for free. I did it myself. I mean, I got it some other way. No. We'll be there in heaven because of God's grace. I hope that's going to be you. The question is, are you saved? If you've been saved, you've been saved by God's grace through your faith, which He gave you to trust His Son as your Savior and Lord. Are you saved? Have you experienced that yet? But the amazing thing is, we, we talk about that a lot, but that's, that's not where it stops. No, no, that's not where God's grace stops at all. The second passage of Scripture we had up there was in Colossians chapter 1. Please turn to that. And you understand that the Apostle Paul was writing to Christian people, born-again believers, who had trusted Jesus as their Savior and their Lord, and they were lived in the city of Colossae. And this is a letter, and I'm kind of having to pick through it a little bit, so if, if we run over part of it and it doesn't make sense, just hang on, we'll get there. He's writing to them, and he said in verse 4, he said, We've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus he, and your love which you have to all the saints. He said, Yeah. You're, you're a wonderful church. You're, you're Christian people. You've got faith in Jesus. Verse 5 says, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel? You heard the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world. It's the same gospel all over the world. It's not one gospel for this nationality or that one or what. No, no, it's for everybody. The good news, the gospel message, it's for everybody. And it bringeth forth fruit. It produces something. And it doth also as it does also in you. You're the fruit that is produced in Colossae. Since the day that you heard of it and you knew the grace of God in truth. Oh, he says a lot in these few words, even though it's not in the phrasing that we're used to. That's the reason I want to pick it apart here. Keep your eyes on the scriptures. He talks about the truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world. That means that even though we're all sinners, the truth of the gospel is God still loves us. That's good news. 
Why should God love us? We've rebelled against Him. We've broken His commandments. We've shaken our fist in His holy face. Say, I'm not going to live your way. I'm going to live my way. Why? How could He still love us? The good news of the gospel is He does. He does love us. And He loved us enough to send His Son Jesus to die on the cross to pay for our sins so we won't have to. So that God can simply forgive us. That's the good news and this wonderful gospel. This good news was delivered to the people in Colossae. Some of them heard it and some of them rejected it. But some of them said, oh, that's true. That's true for me. And they not only accepted the news, but they believed it. They believed the truth and they trusted Jesus and they were saved. And that's the ones he's communicating with here in this letter. He said, you're the fruit. You're what's been produced by the power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's all by God's grace that has happened. When they were saved, they understood and knew the power of the gospel. If you have been saved, my brother and my sister, you understand the power of gospel, a message like nobody else, who, unless they've been saved too. Because the power of the gospel changes people. It changes their lives. It's that wonderful gospel. When they, say, when they were saved, here's what they learned. Here's what they experienced. They experienced their eternal destinies being changed. They experienced the guilt of all their sins being lifted off of their shoulders and they realized, no, I, I can stand before holy God on judgment day and He's not going to condemn me. They've experienced the reality of that. That's the reality, the power of the gospel. Their hearts were changed. They were born again. They became new people. They had new priorities, new things that were important to them. They had new loves in their lives. And things that they used to love to do, they found out it was detestable to God, so they hated it now too. People they couldn't stand before, now they loved. All kinds of things changed in their lives when they were born again. That's the power of the gospel. Apostle Paul said the power of the gospel is to salvation and to those who believe it. Although they, they fit that category. They believed it. Their burdens were lifted. Their souls were saved. Their place in heaven was guaranteed. That is all God's grace. Those people in Colossae did not deserve it. Neither do we. But God offers it to us. He put the love of Christ in them. It says here they showed the love for each other. Let me ask you, do you love Christian people? I mean, just because they're Christians? You get around them and you kind of have a sense. This, this is my sister in Christ. This is my brother in Christ. We, we met a lady the other day. We didn't have to be around her five minutes. There, there was a kindred sense of a kindred spirit with her. Susan, remember who I'm talking about? And, and you weren't there long. There was a love bond between us. I didn't know anything about the lady other than what we learned just in those few minutes of talking with her. She didn't tell us her life history or anything else. She didn't witness to us about Jesus, but there was a sense of a bond between us that we're part of God's family. This is wonderful. And there was a love flowing back and forth between us, and it, and it does. It, it just works that way. And he says, that's what they were doing. They were loving one another. They had love of Christ in them. And that is the beginning of the outpouring of the flow that, that actually begins the moment we're saved. This transformation. And the transformation is not an instantaneous thing that doesn't stop. It continues. God gives you a new life in Christ when you're born again, but you're not born full grown. You have to grow as a Christian. And as you grow, that's part of God's grace, helping you to grow, building you up, making you more like Jesus. Sco scoot down to verse 9 here for just a moment. You're still in Colossians chapter 1. He says, For this cause we also, since we day, day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. He says, You're Christians, you're brothers and sisters in Christ. You're part of the fruit when we're praying for you every single day to desire that you might be filled. Here's what I'm praying for. That you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Filled with the knowledge of of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You know, as we go through life, we make 
have many, many questions. <laughs> we have to make many, many decisions. Wouldn't it be great if we always knew exactly what to choose? I mean, wouldn't it be great just, how, how do I make these choices? Sometimes they're great big monstrous choices. Sometimes they're little bitty things that don't seem like they matter. And then later on you find out, boy, that really did matter. How do we, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could just tap it into the computer and it'll pop up the right answer every time? Well, we struggle with decisions. And we seek advice all kinds of places. Yeah, even on the Internet sometimes, which is not always the best place to go. We go to people who are wiser than we are, older than we are, more mature than we are, and we respect their opinions, and sometimes they're right, but not all the time. Wouldn't it be great if we had some way we could find somebody who was always right? When you go to Almighty God, you find He's always right. When you say, Lord, show me what to do, he's always right. He'll never give you a wrong answer. Never. If you say, Lord, should I turn to the right or turn to the left? If he says right, that's the way to go. If he says stop, that means stop. If he says run, that means run. Listen, he is always right. God is perfect. His decisions are perfect. And his advice to you and me on how to live our lives is absolutely perfect as well. He, and he has a perfect will for our lives guidance that we need. And when we follow His perfect will, we get the best life we could possibly have. And so what we need in our lives is what Paul was praying for for the Christians in, in Colossae, that they would be filled with the knowledge of His will. If you just knew what God's will was and you knew it was perfect and you knew it was right, wouldn't you want to do it? I just, if I just knew, maybe I'd make the right choice. No, you should make the right choice. He, he, he does. He, he says, that's, that's what we need to do. Filled with the knowledge of His will. And look at this, in all wisdom. I wonder why I put that word in there. The difference between a wise person and a foolish person is the wise person says, Lord, I see your will for my life. I, that's the way I'm going. Not my will, but thine be done. <laughs> that's, my, that's how I'm going. Lord, not my plan, but your plan. That's the wise person. The wise person chooses God's will over his own will. We trade our will for God's will. And the ability to do that is given to us by Almighty God. The desire to do it is given to us by Almighty God. And when he gives us that, that's guess what? His grace. That's his grace. Do we deserve that? No. He just blesses us with the ability and the will to know his, uh, the wisdom to know his will and then spiritual understanding. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. As you grow as a Christian, you begin to gain spiritual understanding. You start seeing things through the eyes of God instead of through the eyes of man. You start seeing things on the bigger picture. You start seeing the world as souls that are going to spend an eternity somewhere. Somebody that you may think, I cannot stand that person. I think they ought to burn in hell. God says, I'm not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. God says, my son died for them too. Oh, listen, we start seeing things through God's eyes and it changes us. It changes us. We get his wisdom and spiritual understanding. He lets us see how we can be a blessing to other people, how we can pray for them, how we can pray for the lost, how we can pray for the people we love and pray for the people we can't stand. That's what he's talking about. How we can encourage them to be saved. So you put those three things together. You get the knowledge, you get the wisdom, and you get understanding, and you put all those three together. And guess where that comes from? All three of them. God's amazing grace. Well, why does He pray that for them? Why in the world does He want them to have wisdom and understanding and knowledge? Why does He want them to have that? He tells you in verse 10. Look, that you might walk worthy of the Lord. Wow. Wow. All unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. If we claim to be Christians, our walk should show it. If we claim to be Christians, we ought to act like it. To the point that everybody that follows us around and listens to the words that come out of our mouths, they should say, boy, that's a Christian. They're, they're not like everybody else. That's a Christian. We're walking worthy 
Jesus is our example. If we claim to be Christians, then we're saying, I want to follow Him as my example. He's the Lord of my life. I, I want to imitate Him. And you need to do that. You say, I'm not too sure. How do I go about doing that? Well, how do I imitate Jesus? Here, here's, here, it boils down to this. Jesus was 100% obedient to His Father. And if we're going to imitate Jesus, we're God's children too because we've been saved. We've been born again and got born into God's family, adopted into God's family. We're His children just like Jesus was His child. And so therefore, if we're going to be like Jesus, we have to do what? Be obedient to the Father. Oh, well, if I'm going to be obedient to the Father, I need to know what the Father tells me to do. I need to find out His rules, His regulations, His do's, His don't. I need His guidance. I need His laws. Where do you find those? In the holy book you're holding in your lap, I hope, or you have on your phone. He tells us what He expects of us, how to live a godly life. He tells us how to imitate Jesus and reveal Christ in us. And He says, when we do, we will be fruitful. We will begin producing fruit. Well, what kind of fruit do we produce? Fruit just like us. I got a sad symmetry in my backyard. It has never produced one apple. Never will. Not a banana. I like bananas too. But they won't come off of that tree. Why? Because it's a sad tree. That's all it's ever going to produce. But it will produce sad summas on a good year. So if we're going to produce fruit, we're going to produce that of which the same kind we are. And if you remember back in verse 6, he talked about the fruit being produced by the gospel. He said, you're it. Christian, you're it. You're, you're the fruit I'm talking about. You, you need to be producing others just like you. I want you to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. If we're going to produce more fruit, if we're going to produce more Christians, if, if others are going to come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior and be born again like we have, it's going to be... Because we're living the right kind of life. We're living a godly life, a Christ-like life, and we're telling them the truth of the gospel. And when it happens, if we're going to do that well, our knowledge of God's got to increase too. So what he said, increasing in the knowledge of God. He said, I want you to grow as a Christian. I want you to know God more. As I read that, it, it kind of overwhelmed me. You and I can know God personally. Not just know some of the attributes of God. You can find that in a book. You can find all kinds of books about the attributes of God. I'm talking about knowing Him. Knowing about somebody is one thing, but knowing the person is somebody else. And He says, increase in your knowledge of God. Would you like to know God better? I mean, kind of up close face to face better? If God had a particular aroma, would you like to know what He smells like? If God had a particular temperature, would you like to know how warm His embrace would be? Know Him. Knowing God. Get to know Him. You can do that. He wants us to know Him. Look what He did to get us to be in a position where we could even approach Him. Jesus, the cross. That's what He did. He wants us to know Him. And here in this letter, the Apostle Paul was saying the same thing, that you want to increase in your knowledge of God. We can know God. So how do we get to know God? Well, you communicate with Him. You get to know an individual, a personal individual. You, 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 you communicate with them one way or another. You talk with them and you listen to them. <laughs> you share your thoughts. You share your hopes, your dreams, your fears, and you get to know them one another. You get to know God by communicating with God. You read His Word. You spend time with Him in prayer uninterrupted. And it's not a matter of praying because, oh my goodness, time to pray. i got two minutes. That's all I'm allowing God. Today I'm going to read the Bible and pray. No, no. It's, God, I want to spend some time with you. I need to hear from you. I need to experience you today, dear Lord. Spend some time with Him. 
And when we do, that's how we increase our knowledge of God and how we produce good fruit like us and how we walk worthy of being called Christians and how we gain spiritual understanding and the knowledge of the will of God and the wisdom to carry it out. All that is gained by communicating with God. And He gives it to us as we communicate with Him. And He gives it to us as an act of His amazing grace. It, we don't deserve any of it. And yet he says, here, I want you to know me. I'm going to show you how. I'll enable you to get to know me. That's part of his amazing grace. All this can be part of your life and mine. And the more blessed more we are, the more blessed we'll be. And the more we're going to be a blessing to those around us. And I, I know that he was writing to Christian people who had already trusted Jesus as their Savior and as their Lord. And, and maybe that's all I'm talking to here. Maybe there's not an individual in here that has not yet been born again. There's not an individual here that's still on your way to hell. Maybe that's the case. But if it's not, I want to let you know something. All this began with Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. By grace are you saved through faith. And that's not of yourself, it's a gift of God. So God offers you His grace. He's offering you forgiveness. He's offering you salvation. He's offering you eternal life. He's offering you heaven. He's offering you all of these things and even more. But you have to say, yes, Lord, I'll take it by faith. I have no doubt that He's offering it to all of us. I just don't know if you've received it. Exercise the faith to do that. If you haven't, why in the world are you putting it off? Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your amazing grace offering us wonderful things that we don't deserve. Forgiveness, eternal life, everything. The blessings of guiding us on a day-by-day -day basis. Oh, Father, thank you. I pray for those here this morning that have accepted your Son as their Savior. They've been born again. They know that when they die, they're going to go to heaven. I pray for them, Father, that they might commit themselves to receiving your grace as a, a steady flow into their lives day by day, that you'll bless them as you guide and direct their lives, that they'll be productive for you and be a blessing to those around them. But, Father, I pray most of all, for the one or two or more that might be here this morning that have never publicly trusted Jesus as their Savior and Lord. They're still lost. They're ignoring your wonderful gift of grace and salvation. They're saying no. Maybe I'll take it someday, but not now. Oh, Father, show them the foolishness of that. I pray that today you will give them all the faith that it takes to come and trust your Son as their Savior and as their Lord. Oh God, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.